Ciao a tutti amici, sono Matteo Pirazzini, oggi mi trovo agli Einfield Lake a Doncaster, location bellissima dove si terrà la Mega Match This Final a settembre, la prima settimana di settembre. Oggi mi trovo qui proprio per spiegarvi alcuni approcci degli, dei, degli inglesi su tecniche che noi in Italia pratichiamo molto come la pesca rubesienne. Sono qui da qualche ora e già vi posso dire che gli approcci sono veramente diversi. Qui si utilizzano caster, si utilizzano vermi tagliati, i bigattini solitamente qui vengono usati rossi. Quindi ora vediamo di prendere qualche, qualche bel pesce e di spiegarvi un pochettino come qui in Inghilterra viene approcciato la pesca nelle fisheries che sono i corrispettivi nei nostri laghetti. Whilst I've taken a small break from fishing, I'm just going to explain to you why I've picked the rig that I'm using today. I'm going to start right at the bottom at the hook. This is a Maver ES43 size 16. Now I've chose this hook because of the shape and the colour. First of all, the shape of the hook is perfectly presented when you use a very small piece of worm on. You're never going to get the worm come off because of the shape and you don't lose many fish because of how wide the gape is. Also, the great thing about this hook is the colour. I don't like shiny hooks in commercial fisheries. The fish are very used to seeing lots of hooks. So the more camouflage you can present in your rig, the better. The hook is a black colour, so the fish can't easily see it. Now, the hook length material itself, again, I've tried to embrace the, the camouflage. I'm using fluorocarbon. This is 0,12 diameter and a 15 centimetre long hook length. This allows me to put a shot very close to the hook. Now that shot is now going to be a roughly 17 centimeters away from the hook, which is perfect present presentation when you're not fishing very much on the bottom. The main line itself is just a little bit heavier. It's not fluorocarbon, it's just mono line and it's 014. The shotting pattern itself is very simple. Now the way I'm presenting my bait is with a very small nugget of worms and ground bait, which gets the fish to the bottom very quickly and keeps the fish on the bottom. I am throwing some casters which allow the fish to have a bit of an area but I want all the fish on the bottom nice and presented. So the shotting pattern I'm using is a bulk and two droppers. Now these, these shot are all size 9 shot. The bulk is about 35 centimeters from the top of the loop with two number 9 droppers in between. Now this will get my rig to the bottom very quickly but the last 35 centimeters will fall very slowly. So the last little bit of drop that you get when you present the rig is the most important part for me. So the shot and pattern itself is very simple but very effective. It's very quick, very efficient. One great little tip I use is the bulk itself. Just above it, I have some very small styles. Now this allows me just to trim the float down so I can have a very, very small amount of bristle showing. So if I have four or five very small styles, I can just dink the bristle down as low as possible. Now the depth here today is about two and a half meters, so I've actually picked a 0.5 grammage of float. Now this is a Mava Finesse float, it's got the plastic bristle, which is very important because you've got a small amount of buoyancy, it's a nice length, the line itself actually passes through the body of the float, so you, if you do manage to hook a carp or it comes off, you don't have to worry about the float breaking. It's a carbon stem, which allows the float to, to sink very slowly and you get a very nice drop. You don't have to worry about the, the stem bending at any point. The elastic itself is a 1.8 mil hollow. Now I find this a perfect balance from catching roach and skimmers to an odd big carp. It's a very, very nice balance. The kinder pot I'm using is the Maver squeezy pot. The way I'm feeding my bait, I'm feeding after pretty much every single fish. So a very small ball of worms and ground bait after every single fish, just presented in the pot. I can tap the ball in, into the water, and lower my rig right on top of it. And this, when it's very close to the tip of the, 
the top kit, you can be extremely accurate. The top kit itself is very important. Now, the way I'm fishing will allow me to catch very small fish to very big fish. The elastic's very balanced, the hook, the line, everything is really nicely balanced. But one of the most important things is, is that you have the side puller. So I'm, when I'm catching my skimmers and my roach, I'll just be able to swing them and net them. But when I hook a carp, I can get the carp within netting range, pull the elastic out, and it will allow me to, to net them very easily. An all round, very balanced rig. When I'm fishing for 25, 30 kilos of fish, I don't have to fish very quickly. I can catch every fish in my swim and I can really come up with a good weight. The situation we have in England on lakes that we fish the competitions is that they're not only stuffed full of big carp, but there's a big head of skimmers, roach, perch. Now, when we fish the competition, if the required weight is 25, 30 kilos, these fish, the bream, the roach, cannot be ignored. The best way of catching this sort of weight, 25, 30 kilos, is to catch a few carp, but a lot of bream mixed in. Now, one of the best ways I've found of catching everything, the bream and the carp, is to fish with worms, casters, and a very small amount of ground bait. When you prepare your bait in the right way and approach it like I have today, you can catch a big weight using this method. I'm gonna take a break from my fishing, go up the bank and explain to you in a little bit more detail exactly how I prepare the bait. One of the most important things for me when fishing competitions is preparing my bait correctly. I said to you briefly before that I'm fishing for a mixed bag of fish today, roach, skimmers, perch, and maybe the odd big carp. I've chose to use worms, casters, and ground bait. I'm just gonna to explain to you in a little bit more detail exactly how I prepare it. First of all, I've mixed my ground bait up, but I've left my ground bait quite dry. I've got my big bait box full of casters, and I've got my worms. Now, the most important part for me is chopping my worms and adding the ground bait correctly. So first of all, I get a small amount of worms with hardly any peat or mud on them, so they're fairly neat. I chop them in a small cup, so they're very finely chopped. Keep going, keep chopping. They will expand back out, but just keep chopping until they're very fine. Just maybe two, three mil pieces. Place that into a bait box, like so, and you're left with some nice, neat worms. The next part is adding in the dry ground bait. I like to mix the ground bait very dry so that when it adds to the worms, the worms juice gets sucked into the ground bait and becomes very sticky. So once I've mixed this round, I'm left after two or three minutes of the ground bait absorbing the juice from the worms, I'm left from a really sticky, stodgy mix. Now when you introduce this with the kinder pot, this will go straight to the bottom. Hardly any bait, any coming off it, it will lead the fish to the bottom in a very small, short area which will allow you to lower your float right on top of it and be very accurate. Now the casters play a big part as well because after I've dropped my little ball in what I like to do is throw a big handful of casters. Now this creates some noise which also attracts fish and it also creates a little bit more of an area so the fish aren't pinned down in such a small area. The fish can graze about, they can pick an odd caster up and then the little ball of worm will pin them in a very tight area so you can lower your float dead right on top of it catch a fish, come in, net the fish and repeat the process. It's a great way of fishing and when you're fishing for weights just under 60, 70 pounds and you want to catch your bream, your skimmers, it's, for me it's the best way of fishing. Bene, adesso il sole si è alzato, le carpe sono, si sono spostate a galla, mi sono messo a pescare con una canna da 14,50 m proprio a galla pasturando con il pellet e con i caster, sempre esche che guardate intanto la carpa che è saltata, eh, sempre esche che in Italia sono pochissimo utilizzate. Allora qui in, in Inghilterra di solito la pesca a galla si fa facendo battere la lenza, cosa che però mi sembra che oggi abbia portato risultati un pochino più scarsi rispetto alla pesca che si fa da noi in Italia che è, eccone un'altra, che è facendo saltellare il, il galleggiante sulla riva, quindi facendogli fare, adesso l'ho slamata, facendogli fare dei saltelli sul, proprio sulla punta. Potete vedere la lenza che è veramente semplice, 
due pallini, un amo con un bandum su una lenza diretta dello 020. Adesso torno, torno fuori. La canna è leggerissima, si tiene veramente bene in mano. Ecco. Adesso infiondo una decina di, di caster. Ecco fatto. Vedete che invece che far roteare la lenza io non faccio altro che farla saltellare. Una, una tecnica questa che mi, mi sta dando dei bellissimi risultati. Tanto potete vedere che bellissimo posto, in che bellissima cornice ci troviamo. Abbiamo proprio le carpe sotto in questo momento. Eh. Adesso voglio provare andando dei pellet. Ecco che abbiamo allamato un'altra bella carpa. Bellissimo. Pescare in, questi, in queste fisheries c'è veramente una calma, una, una, una tranquillità assoluta. Guardate che brema. Guardate che bella brem che abbiamo preso pescando a galla, sicuramente un pesce non, non usuale con questo tipo di pesca ma che non, non si rifiuta di mangiare sicuramente a profondità così poco elevate. Andiamo subito di nuovo in pesca. In queste fisheries è consentito, anzi obbligatorio, l'uso di due nasse, una per le carpe e una invece per i cosiddetti silver fish, che sono in pratica tutto ciò che non è una carpa, quindi dal, da una specie di carassio che qui si chiama F1 al carassio classico, alle brem, i gardon, perché in queste fisheries qui, al contrario dei nostri carpodromi, sono presenti tutti i tipi di pesci, eh? addirittura i persici. Adesso fra poco poi cederò la canna di nuovo a Callum Dix, che sicuramente vi potrà spiegare molto meglio il loro approccio alla, alla pesca a galla, che è molto diverso da quello che sto facendo io in questo momento perché la loro è una pesca molto più frenetica perché continuano a battere la lenza, la lenza sull'acqua però come vi ripeto oggi sembra che stia rendendo più una pesca un pochettino più statica tenendo un pochettino di più la lenza in acqua Ecco un'altra carpa, questa è grossa, questo sembra essere davvero un bel pesce, bisogna continuare finché le abbiamo a tenere il posto pasturato. Ecco che ci spostiamo, veniamo indietro, eccoci. Io non, non, non so come descrivervi la felicità che ho nel pescare in queste fisheries, è veramente un'esperienza che tutti i pescatori dovrebbero provare almeno una volta nella vita, guardate che bel pesce. 
Lo teniamo basso, prepariamo il godino. Ecco qua. Un'altra bellissima carpa delle fisheries inglesi. Adesso la slamiamo. Guardate che bel pesce. Via. Ok, adesso smetto di pescare, lascio pescare Calam Dix che così vi potrà far vedere il suo approccio alla pesca a galla o alla shallow fishing come chiamano qui in Inghilterra. Like Matteo, I've now moved on to the long pole. It's getting warmer and warmer as the day goes on, the wind's dropping slightly. It really does present itself to fish to come up in the water. It's 7 or 8 foot, maybe a little bit more 9 foot where I'm fishing. So with regular feed, with pellets and casters, I would expect the fish to come right up in the water, up to a foot deep. We're fishing probably two and a half foot deep at the moment, and it seems quite a nice depth. We've caught some bream, we've caught some big carp and an odd crassio. I'm feeding, at the moment, I'm feeding casters with an odd pellet, with a pellet on the hook. What we found, fishing shallow with casters on the hook, we've caught too many small fish. So what I'm actually doing is feeding a lot of casters, a few pellets, with a pellet on the hook. And that seems a real nice balance between how many small fish you catch and how many big fish you catch. You really have got to judge the way that you feed and fish on what weight you need to catch. The competition's here. Now at the moment you'll need 100 to 150 pounds to win. Maybe it's 50 kilos. So you're going to have to catch some carp at some point. Fishing pellets and caster shallow gives you that opportunity. I'll just feed a couple more times and I'll bring it in and show you about the rig. First of all, we'll start from the very bottom. We're actually using a hair rig. Now when fishing shallow with casters and pellets, I'll always use a hair rig. The percentage of bites that you hit compared to what you miss is massively in your favor. So I'm just using a small pellet band. Now this size of pellet band allows me to put a pellet or a caster onto it. So it's great when you're feeding both baits. The hook itself is quite a decent size hook. I mean, you could hook some really big fish shallow, carp in excess of five kilos. So you don't want to use too small of a hook. A size 16 eyed hook is perfect. As I did on the bottom rig, I'm using a fluorocarbon hook length. This one's just a bit thicker, 015. Now again, I think the camouflage effect really does give you uh, um, an advantage. The main line itself, not fluorocarbon, we're actually using a 020 main line. Now I like to use quite thick main lines when I'm fishing shallow, as the actual line's a lot stiffer. So when I'm, what I'm doing here today is actually slapping the rig over, rotating it over, and this allowed me to not get as many tangles. So 020 main line, 015 hook length, just nicely balanced. The float itself, is a brand new MVR, just a very short float, very durable, quite a thick plastic bristle, hollow, so you've got plenty of buoyancy. It's quite a small float, so it doesn't take many shot, just two number eight shot, and that's really important. You don't want, when you actually rotate the rig over into the water, you don't want the bulk shot making more noise when it slaps the water than the hook bait. So it's important that the hook bait makes more noise than the bulk. A small float and a small bulk is really presents itself for that. I've got, I'm fishing maybe just under a meter deep with the float to the hook and I've got quite a bit of line between my float and my pole tip. This allows me to rotate the rig and make quite a bit of noise. If you fish a very short line you don't get as much noise when the rig hits the water so you get a bigger rotation with a slightly longer line between the float and the pole tip. The elastic itself It's a slightly beefed up elastic. That's actually a two mil jaw core. So because we're going to hook a few more big fish when we're fishing shallow compared to what we did on the bottom. The top kit itself is exactly the same as what we used on the bottom with the puller kit. 
exactly the same. So if you do hook a bream, it's no problem. You've got plenty of elastic out. But when you do come into those carp, you can get ship the pole back, get it onto the top kit, and use the use the puller. Now that's the rig, that's the setup, that's what I like to use. We, it's proved today that it's working quite well. Now I just want to talk you through the routine that I use when I'm fishing, actually fishing shallow. What I try and do is get into a rhythm with how I'm fishing, the fish I'm catching, and how I'm doing it. The feeding is the main thing. I try and feed three or four times when the rig's out of the water, when I'm actually playing the fish, which I'll show you now. Start with, I'm actually going to put a pellet on to start with, just so we don't catch too many small fish. So I just slot the pellet straight into the pellet band, put the top kit on, whatever bait you decide to feed, cast as all pellets, feed first. So that's the first step. Next step, ship the pole out, all the way to the length where you're feeding. Today I'm using it 14.5 meters. First thing I do now is slap the rig over three times. On the fourth time that you slap the rig over, let the float go into the water and watch for a bite. Maybe leave it, oh, there was a bite straight away. Maybe leave it five, 10 seconds and slap the rig over again. What you're actually doing by this is feeding, getting some fish into the area. And then when you ship your pole out, you slap your rig over and you create a noise when there's only your hook bait left in the swim. So the bait that you fed with a catapult is now sinking and your hook bait is just left there with plenty of noise. A lot of the time, like that, you'll get a bite straight away. Now that I've hooked one, the first thing I'll do, once the fish is out of the swim, is feed. So feed again. Once the fish is in control, I'll ship back maybe two, three sections. I'll feed again. What you're doing by feeding this often when you're playing the fish is to create a feeding frenzy when your rig isn't in the water. So now the whole time I'm playing this fish, the fish are out there feeding, they're ready so that when you do ship your pole back out, it's good for a bite. A lot of the time when you get into the correct routine and there's plenty of fish in your peg, you don't spend much time with the rig in the water. You're feeding, you're feeding, you're working hard whilst you're playing the fish. And then when your rig goes into the water, because you fed it so well, you'll catch a fish pretty soon. Like that one, probably took 15, 20 seconds, and I'm into it. Now I've fed twice already. What I try and do is feed three or four times whilst playing the fish. So it seems like quite a decent fish, but we've got real good gear on. We've got strong elastic, strong hook length. Get it back to the top kit as soon as you can. Just take your time and then use the side puller. Once the fish is under control, oh, that one's going back out again. That's it, just stay in control. At any point you can ship back on if the fish really wants to go. Just take your time. Really, really take your time. Now the fish, I've got the top kit in my hands. The fish is under control. Next step, feed again. Just really take your time. You don't have to rush. The one thing you have to remember is that the more time you take when playing the fish, is more time for the fish to really settle and become happy feeding out there. Seems like a real decent fish, maybe two, three kilos. So now I've fed three times since I've hooked this fish. I'll try and feed again in a second. And then once I've netted the fish, once the fish is in the net, I'll feed again. And I'm ready to repeat the process. So now the fish is in with netting range. You can see I've used the, the puller. I've really got in control with the fish. Really in control. There you go. Probably three kilos, that one. So now, I've got the fish into the net. Next step, feed again. Unhook the fish.
put the pellet back on, exactly the same as before. Feed again, so now this is the fourth time. Feed again and repeat the process. Now if you get into a, a swim where there's lots of fish competing, there's lots of fish feeding and the weather's correct like it is today, sunny, warm, you can really catch a big weight. Bene, ora abbiamo decisamente cambiato tecnica, ho preso in mano una canna inglese, canna che nasce proprio qui in queste terre, è la nuovissima Signature Pro eh, Pellet Woggler da 12 piedi, una canna in due pezzi, infatti mi trovo a pescare in questo momento con la tecnica del Pellet Woggler. Cos'è il Pellet Woggler? Il Pellet Woggler è un galleggiantino da 4 grammi in questo caso con l'antenna cava che ci serve proprio per lanciare una distanza massima di 20 metri utilizziamo per pescare un terminale abbastanza lungo sui 30 cm con una e rig come potete vedere con attaccato un pellet da 4 mm bene l'approccio la, alla pesca è abbastanza semplice e basta lanciare affondiamo il filo dopodiché basta semplicemente pasturare con una piccola quantità di pellet prima del galleggiante di modo da non spaventare i pesci ecco e poi ci richiamiamo dentro il galleggiante questo è tutto quello che bisogna fare nella tecnica del pellet woggler a questo punto pasturiamo con 7-8 pellet alla volta, si può richiamare il, il galleggiante per far sì che possa fare un invito, è importante avere un ritmo di pasturazione molto molto intenso proprio perché pescando non con la rubesien come prima dobbiamo richiamare il pesce sulla nostra zona di pesca. Quindi in questo momento, come vedete, io sto tenendo una pasturazione abbastanza veloce. Stiamo pescando a una quarantina, cinquantina di metri, ho appena visto una mangiata e l'ho lisciata, a una quarantina di metri, centimetri scusate, di profondità, come potete vedere. Adesso proviamo a togliere qualche centimetro. Benissimo, e ripetiamo la stessa, la stessa mossa, quindi lanciamo, affondiamo il filo, pasturiamo con i nostri pellet, e ci richiamiamo dentro il galleggiante.
when I cast out and that plop of the pellet hasn't taken a fish, I then feed six, maybe 10 pellets, just short of the float. And then you wind the float back into the feed as the feed lands. So you can get one or two chances at that. And then if it doesn't happen again, you can give it a little twitch. And it's basically all you're doing is making the pellet rise and fall, just imitating the loose feed. So you say you cast out, you plop it in. If you don't get a bite, you feed a little bit short, maybe a metre. And then when that doesn't happen, you try it again. Feed a metre short. And hopefully you pick a fish off. And it happened this time, actually. So we had about three bites of the cherry as such. Tip the go to the car. You bring him in close and I start the fight under the rod tip. And that's where this new Signature Pro comes in, as you can see by the bend. smaller than I thought that. It's two kilo fish and a fork like Mike Tyson. Bene, la liberiamo in nassa e a questo punto passo la parola a Callum Dix che ci spiegherà come affrontare la tecnica del method feeder dalla montatura a come riempire il method al lancio e infine a come prendere i pesci. Diamo la parola a Callum. The feeder setup that I'm using today is extremely simple. To start with, the hook length itself is four inches long. The rules here at Hayfield say that you have to have a four inch hook length, but if you could get away with using a two inch, do so. I think it's better, you feel, I think you hook more fish with a shorter hook length. The hook itself is a size 14 CS26 with a very small band on, just for banding any hook bait. The one I've used today is just a boily white pellet type hook bait, or even just your coarse pellets, is absolutely fine. The hook length material itself is 022, I think you've got to use strong hook clamps because you've got a big heavy weight just above the hook so it does lead to breakages now and again. And when you use heavier hook clamps, the hook length becomes stiffer so I think you hook more fish. Just up from the hook length, I've got a little quick change bead so at any point in the match or any point in your pleasure day you can change your hook length, you can change your hook, smaller or bigger, whatever way you want to go. The, the feeder itself is a 38 gram UFO inline feeder. Today the island is at about 40 metres, the wind's in my face, so casting can be quite tricky. With a slightly heavier feeder than normal, a 38 gram, just makes accuracy a little bit easier. The line I'm using is made of a Jurassic Classic, the 023, it breaks at about 10 pounds. So real strong, durable line. Where I'm casting today, there is a few rocks close to the island, there's going to be a few snags. When you hook fish, the line's going to be dragging through this. The last thing you want is to be fishing away and then your main line breaks. You lose your feeder, you lose your clip, your rhythm goes. The rod I'm using is a brand new Maver Diamond 10 foot 6. Now, I've got to say this is one of the best rods I've ever used. It's the perfect length for casting to islands at this distance. It's not too long, 11, 12 foot I feel like the accuracy would go, but it still gives you plenty of poke to get to make the distance and still become accurate. The reel I'm using, very similar to the one I was using on the pellet waggler, just stepped up in size. This is a 4,000 size. If I want to go to 50, 60 meters, I can do. The bigger spool just allows me to get bigger distances when I'm casting. So all round, a real strong, durable, balanced setup, perfect for distances and fishing of this nature. 
loading the feeder when using the new Maver UFO feeders and loading spoon becomes very, very simple. The way I do it is a little bit different. I like to double mold it. So the first stage is to get the mold, fill it so it's overfill, press the feeder into it, and then you've got a full feeder. That's the first step. The second bit of it is to take a small amount, maybe a third of the mold full, place your hook bait into it, squash it down and repeat the process. Squeeze it into it. Now you've got a full feeder and an extra little bit. For fishing to islands, I like to have the full amount of bait in my feeder every single time. Using the mold spoon becomes very, very easy because you never get any stickages. The feeder won't stick in the mold at any point, no matter what the weather or how dry or wet your pellets are. Stick with this, with this feeder and this mold, and it makes life very, very simple. You see the pellets how I've got them here, to get them exactly the same. First of all, I get my dry two mil pellets, put them in one bait box. I get another bait box, fill it with water, and then tip some of the water out of one bait box onto the dry two mil pellets so that the water is just lipping over the top of them. Then I get the bait box that was full of water, place it on top so there's lots of pressure going down on the wet two mils, leave it for half an hour, take the bait box back off of the two mils and they should be perfect every time. The most important thing for me when I'm feeder fishing, especially on lakes when I'm casting up to an island, is to be accurate. First of all, the most simple thing is to pick yourself a marker. Today on the island, we've got a bit of grass and then a brick. I'm using the actual brick on the island as my marker, so I can aim at that brick every single cast. The, mo the harder thing to do is to get your distance correct every time. The best anglers, when you watch them feed a fish in, they'll be hitting the clip, hitting the island within six inches every single cast. The only way of doing this is with a line clip. Now, the best way of doing it is to get to your peg in the morning, get your set up correctly how you want, and then start casting your feeder and dinking it in. Every cast a little bit further until you get your feeder in the exact right place. Once the feeder's in the exact right place, put your rod into the rest and clip up. Now that means everything's on maximum distance. It's virtually impossible to go too far and to go onto the island and snag up. What I do, I've got my, my clip dead, dead right. So I'd load my feeder up as I showed you earlier, cast out, nice and accurate, hit the clip back and then lower the feeder in. So my line clip, as you can see there, is bang on at full maximum distance. My rod's on the rest and the feeder's within six inches of the bank. This way, you keep your distance perfect every time, get your marker dead right, and the more accurate you can be, the more fish you'll catch. Ok ragazzi, siamo arrivati alla fine del video, anche perché la pioggia sta diventando sempre più forte. Vi ringrazio tutti per l'attenzione, spero che questo video vi possa essere piaciuto. Abbiamo tentato di spiegarvi gli approcci dei maestri inglesi alle loro pesche, alla pesca nelle fisheries. Abbiamo utilizzato la rubesienne, abbiamo utilizzato i Wogler pellet, abbiamo utilizzato il method. Bene, a questo punto non mi resta che ringraziare tantissimo Callum Dix e Lee Edwards. E io adesso continuo a pescare ancora per qualche ora e ci vediamo nel prossimo video. Ciao a tutti!